Hello, everyone. Um, wow, it's a very full crowd. Perhaps you're all here hoping to learn something about machine learning. And that will happen. You will learn something about machine learning. Perhaps you're here hoping to learn something practical. That will not happen. You will probably not learn anything practical. But you will get to see some very interesting things, and we'll get to talk about some interesting things. And that's why this talk, unlike most talks, comes with a few warnings. Uh, because we're going to look at some imagery that's like a little disturbing, although it's not really clear why it's disturbing, and then we're going to talk about why it's disturbing, and we're going to talk about what that says about our own thought processes. And all kinds of things can pour out when you start opening dams like that. And so if any of this looks like it'll just be too much, there's many other tents, but otherwise, welcome. My name is Ashi. And I am a senior software engineer at GitHub, which has nothing whatsoever to do with the talk that you're about to hear. Because today, I'm going to talk about a hobby of mine. I want to share some of the things that I've learned at the intersection of computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence. I've spent years being fascinated by how we think, how we perceive, how it is that the machinery of our bodies, this chemical system, turns sensory data into qualitative experiences. <clears throat> and why are our experiences shaped in the way they are? Why do we suffer? And for years, I've also been fascinated by artificial intelligence, by machine learning. And I think we all have. We are watching these machines begin to approximate the tasks of human cognition in sometimes unsettling ways. And so today, I want to share with you some of what I've learned. Some of it is solid research, some is solid speculation, and all of it speaks to a truth that I have come to believe, which is that we are computations, and our worlds are created on an ancient computer, powerful beyond imagining. So let's begin. Part one, hallucinations. This person is Mikel Pereo Nieto, and he has something to show us. Just as soon as I interact with the tab. It starts with these simple patterns, these splotches of light and dark, like images from the first eyes. This is going to give way into more complex shapes, lines and colors, and curves, and then more. We're diving through the layers of the Inception image classifier, and it seems that there are whole worlds in here. We have these shaded, multichromatic hatches, and the crystalline farm fields of an alien world. Deeper, we get to the cells of plants. <clears throat> so to understand where these visuals are coming from, let's take a look inside. The job of an image classifier is to reshape its input, which is the square of pixels, into its output, which is a probability distribution. So the probability that this image contains a cat, the probability of a dog, a person, a banana, a toaster, for all of the image classes that this recognizer is going to recognize. And it does this through a series of convolutional filters. So convolutional filters are basically Photoshop filters. Each neuron in a convolutional layer has a receptive field. That's some square of the previous layer that it's looking at. Each convolutional layer applies a filter. So specifically, it applies an image kernel. So it takes a matrix of numbers, where each number represents the weight of an input neuron and it multiplies the corresponding input neurons with their weights and sums them all up to get the output value. We use the same filter across the entire layer, and the values in that filter are learned during training. So training works like this. We feed the classifier a labeled image, something where we know what's in it, we know what the results should be, and it outputs predictions, which are at first extremely wrong. And then we math, to figure out how wrong those predictions were. And then we math again, nudging each and every single filter in the direction that would have produced a better result. 
So the term for that is gradient descent. <clears throat> the deep dream process, the process that creates these trippy visuals, inverts this. This visualization is recursive. So to compute the next frame, we feed the current frame into the network. And we run it through the network's many layers until we come to the layer that we're interested in. And then we math. What could we do to the input image to make this layer activate more? And then we adjust the image in that direction. We just tweak every single one of its pixels. The term for that is gradient ascent. And then finally, we scale the image up very slightly to create this neat zooming effect and also to keep it from fixating on small patterns. <clears throat> Every 100 frames, we move to a deeper layer or a layer to the side. Inception has a whole lot of layers, and they're not arranged in a neat linear stack. So Mikhail just kind of picked ones that looked interesting. And that gives us this. We start with these rudiments of light and shadow, and then much deeper, we have this like city of Kodama's situation happening. This is going to give rise to the spider observation area in which spiders observe you. But it's all right, because the spiders will quickly become corgis. And then the corgis are going to become the 70s. Down here, there's this interesting space of kind of nearly human eyes, which are going to become the familiar dog slugs, and then dog bird slugs. Uh, there was a unfortunate saxophonist teleporter accident. And then finally, kind of near the bottom, we have the flesh zones with a side of lizard. And, OK, when I first saw this video, I was looking at this and kind of seeing this thing, and I'm like, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And I show it to my roommate, and she says, wow, that kind of looks like Donald Trump. And <laughs> I think that says more about the state of our neural networks than this one. There's like something about the familiarity and the, the lizard juxtaposition. But I do want you to notice and think about what it means that all of the flesh inside of this recognizer is so very pale. So this is all pretty trippy. Yeah. Why is that? What does it mean for something to be trippy? To figure that out, let's take a look inside ourselves. Meet Scully. Scully doesn't actually need all this cruft, because we just want to look at Scully's visual system, which starts here, in the retina. So Scully's retina, your retina, our retinas, they're pretty weird. Light comes into them, and then it immediately hits this membrane. There's a layer of ganglions, which are not actually photoreceptive, though some of them are just very slightly photoreceptive. Um, and then there's several other layers of stuff that do important things. When I was doing this research, it, they're, they're a part of the visual system, but they're, what they do is kind of complex to characterize. Anyway, there's many layers of things. And then at the very back of our retinas, are the photoreceptors, the rods and cones. And so light comes in, and it winds its way through these four layers of tissue and hits a photoreceptor. That photoreceptor gets excited. <clears throat> it sends out a signal to its ganglions, which then have to send it somewhere. Where does it go? Right, it goes to the optic nerve, which is routed through the center of the eye. And so the image sensors in our eyes are mounted backwards, and there's a hole drilled through the center of it. And that's kind of all OK, because we can patch it all up in software later. So there's a few other problems. Problem one, our retinas have 120 million luminance receptors. That's, those are rods. And then 6 million uh, color receptors. Those are cones. There are 10 times fewer ganglions than that. And also, <clears throat> if you figure out the maximum data transmission rate of a neuron and like multiply it by the number of neurons in the optic nerve, you can sort of figure out that the optic nerve has about 10 megabits of bandwidth, which 
If you think about the last time you were trying to zoom on a 10 megabit connection, it, it didn't really look as crisp as the image from your eye, did it? No, your, our eyes are really incredible, and 10 megabit bandwidth is literally slower than Wi-Fi. And so how does it work? How do our retinas do this? Well, they do what you might do if you had to solve this problem, and they compress the data. So each ganglion connects to a patch of about 100 photoreceptor cells. That's its receptive field. Um, this receptive field is divided into a central disk and a surrounding region. So we have the center and the surround. And when there's no light on the entire field, the ganglion doesn't fire. Simple. And when the whole thing is illuminated, it sort of weakly fires. Maybe more surprising. And then there's a crucial difference. When only the surround is illuminated and the center is dark, about half of the ganglions in our eye, they fire rapidly. But with the same stimulus, the other half of the ganglions won't fire at all. And then the, those ganglions behave in exactly the opposite way. When the center is bright and the surround is dark, they will fire rapidly. And so these ganglions are scattered throughout our retina. And taken together, you can kind of think about how this, how this looks. It means that wherever there is a significant delta, the ganglions will be firing very fast, which means what we have in our eyeballs is an edge detection filter. So this processing lets us downsample the signal from our photoreceptors 100 times while retaining vitally important information, namely where the boundaries of objects are. So then the signal goes into the brain. It hits the optic chiasma, where the data streams from your left and right eyes cross, and where stereo 3D vision is computed. It's processed by the thalamus, which is responsible, amongst other things, for our eyes' autofocus, which is something that, when you think about it, you definitely have, but you've probably never considered. And each step in the signal pathway is performing some amount of signal processing. It's extracting some data. And that's all before we even get to the visual cortex, which is all the way around here in the back. So our visual cortex is arranged into a stack of neuronal layers. The signal from our eyes stays pretty spatially oriented throughout the cortex. And so there's some slice of tissue back here, say, that's responsible for pulling faces out of this part of your visual field, with all of the redundancies and slop that we've come to expect from any neural network, biological or artificial. And every layer, every neuron in a layer of our visual cortex has a receptive field that is some chunk of the previous layer that it's looking at. Neurons in a given layer respond to the same signal in roughly the same way. And that operation, distributed over an entire layer of neurons, extracts various features from the signal. And we notice that our visual cortex works like this. Early layers extract simple features, like lines and curves and edges. And then more complex ones get extracted later, features like gradients and surfaces, objects and eyes and faces. It's no accident that we see very similar behavior in Inception, because convolutional neural networks, the architecture that Inception instantiates, those were inspired by the design of our visual cortex. Of course, our visual cortex is different from Inception in many ways. Inception is this straight shot through, input to output, one pass. But our visual cortex contains crazy amounts of feedback loops. We have these pyramidal neurons, so named because they look kind of like pyramids, um, that connect deeper layers of tissue to earlier ones. And these create feedback loops which let the behavior of later layers inform the processing of earlier layers. So we might turn up the edge detection where, in a region where later we detect an object. So this behavior lets our visual system adapt and focus not optically focus, but attentionally focus. This gives us and our visual system the ability to ruminate on visual input well before we become consciously aware of it, improving our predictions over time. 
So you know this feeling, I think. You see something, and then you realize it's something else. <clears throat> or you look at a dress, and you're like, is it blue and gold, or is it gold and blue? <laughs> and sometimes, you'll, sometimes our perceptions will even flip between multiple interpretations. So this process is mediated by all kinds of chemical signaling transponders, but there's one particular pathway that I want to look at because our pyramidal cells are covered in serotonin receptors. And different kinds, of pyramidal, different, yeah, different kinds of pyramidal cells respond to serotonin a little bit differently, but generally, they find it exciting. And don't we all? You might be familiar with serotonin from its starring role as the target of every typical antidepressant, which tend to be serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So when serotonin gets released into your brain, they make it stick, a lot, or stick around longer, thereby treating depression. Some side effects may occur. Now, most serotonin is actually located in your gut, where it controls bowel movement. It signals to your gut that it's got food in it, and it should go on and do what it does to food. And that seems to be what the molecule signals throughout your body, resource availability. And for complex animals like us, resources can be very abstract, social resources, as well as energetic ones. That your pyramidal cells respond excitedly to serotonin suggests that we focus on that which we believe will nourish us. Now, it's not correct as a blanket statement to say that pyramidal cells are excited by serotonin. In fact, different there are different kinds of serotonin receptors, and their binding produces different effects. So there are five HT1A receptors, which actually tend to be somewhat inhibitory, causing drowsiness. Five HT3 receptors in the brain, they're, they're typically associated with feelings of queasiness and anxiety. And five HT3 receptors in the gut, they make it run backwards. So most anti-emetic drugs and anti-nausea drugs, like Dramamine, are 5-HT3 antagonists. There is another serotonin receptor, one that the pyramidal cells in your brain find particularly exciting. This is the 5-HT2A receptor. This is the primary target for every known psychedelic drug. It is what enables our brains to create psychedelic experiences. So, Say you go to a show, and you eat a little piece of paper, and that piece of paper makes its way down into your stomach, and it dissolves, and it releases molecules of lysergic acid diethylamide into your gut. LSD doesn't bind to 5-HT3 receptors particularly, and so if you feel butterflies in your stomach, it's probably because you're excited for what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is this. The LSD will diffuse into your blood, where it has no trouble crossing the blood-brain barrier. It's tiny, but powerful, like you. It'll diffuse deep into your brain, into your visual cortex, where it finds a 5-HT2A receptor and locks into place. There, the molecule will stay bound for around 221 minutes. That's four hours, which is a really very long time for a biochemical reaction. They think that a couple of proteins snap into place and form sort of a lid over the receptor, trapping LSD inside, which explains its very long half-life. And while it's rattling around in there, our little LSD molecule is stimulating a feedback loop in our visual cortex. It's sending a signal that says, pay attention. What you're looking at may be nourishing. And so the pattern-finding machinery in our brain starts to run over time and at different rates. In one moment, the pattern in a tapestry will seem to extend into the world beyond it. In another, it's the trees that are moving and breathing, the perception of movement, a visual hypothesis that's being allowed to grow wild. With Deep Dream, we asked what would excite some layer of inception, and then we adjusted the input image in that direction. But there's no comparable gradient ascent process in the biological psychedelic experience. And that's because we are not looking at an input image. We're looking at the output of the network. We are the output of the network. The output of your visual cortex is a signal carrying visual perceptions, these kind of proto-qualia, 
which will be integrated by other circuits in your brain into your next moment of conscious experience. So inception is not that complex. Inception does not have conscious experience per se, but also inception never gets that far. We never even run it all the way to the classification stage. We never ask it what it sees in all this. But we could. <clears throat> in fact, we could perform this amplification process on a final result rather than an intermediate one. For example, we could ask, what would it take for you to see this banana as a toaster? Or say, don't these skiers kind of look like this dog? So these are adversarial examples, images that have been tuned to give classifiers frank hallucinations, the confident belief that they're seeing something that just isn't there. And they're not completely wild, these robot delusions. I mean, that sticker does look a bit like a toaster. It's very shiny, certainly. And those skiers do kind of look like a dog. If you squint, you can see the head, and there's the body, and it's not the same dog, but I can kind of see a dog in it. So a person might, if they're looking at this, and they're far away, and they're drunk, think for a moment that it's a big dog. But they probably wouldn't conclude that it's a big dog, because the recurrent properties of our visual cortex not to mention the whole rest of our brain, means that our sense of the world is stateful. It's this continuously refined hypothesis whose state is held by the state of our neurons. A parse tree is carved out of a fixed multilayer neural network, like a sculpture is carved from rock. This is the opening for the paper on capsule networks, a new kind of visual recognition architecture that Google released a couple of years ago. Our perceptions are this process of constant refinement, which may actually point the way towards more robust recognition architectures, recurrent convolutional neural networks that ruminate upon images, making better classifications, or at least providing a signal that something is off about an input. There are adversarial examples for the human visual system, after all, and we call them optical illusions, and they generally feel pretty weird to look at. So in this image, we can feel our sensory interpretation of the scene flipping between three alternatives, a little box in front of a big one, or a box in a corner, or a box missing one. And in this Munker illusion, there's something scintillating in the color of the dots, which are all the same. So if we designed convolutional neural networks with recurrence, it's possible that they could exhibit such behavior um, as well, which maybe doesn't sound like such a good thing on the face of it. Let's make our image classifiers vacillating and uncertain. Let's make our self-driving cars unsure of themselves. But it's our ability to hem and haw and reconsider our own perceptions at many levels that gives our perceptual system such tremendous robustness. Paradoxically, being able to second-guess ourselves allows us greater confidence in our predictions. It's because we are doing science in every moment, the cells of our brains continuously reconsidering and refining a shifting hypothesis about the state of the world. It's because of that that we have this ability to adapt and operate within a pretty extreme range of conditions, even while we're tripping face, or while we're asleep. Part two. Dreams. These are not real people. These are the photos of fake celebrities which have been dreamt up by, again, a generative adversarial network. A pair of networks, really, which are particularly creative. The networks improve through continuous mutual refinement. And it works like this. On the one side, we have the creator. This is a deep learning network not unlike Inception, but trained to run in reverse. This network we feed with noise, just a bunch of random numbers up there, and it learns to generate images. 
But of course, it has no way to learn. In the technical parlance, it lacks a gradient without another opponent, without the adversary. The adversary is an image classifier, much like Inception, but it's trained on only two image classes, real and fake. Its job is to distinguish the creator's forgeries from true faces. So we feed this network with actual examples of celebrity faces, and the adversary learns. And then we use those results to train the creator. So if the creator makes a satisfying forgery, which is not detected as fake, it's doing well. If its forgeries are detected, we backpropagate that failure so that it can learn what a face is supposed to look like. Now, I should tell you that the technical terms for these networks are the generator and the discriminator. And I changed the names because names are important, but also meaningless. They don't change the structure of the training methodology, which is this incredibly powerful, semi-supervised learning technique. See, we haven't found every possible image and labeled it plausible and implausible, and that would be an impossible task. Instead, we have this game, this recursive co-training process, in which two circuits ruminate on a space of possibilities and extract maximum value from a relatively small amount of training data. And this process is perhaps helpful for neural circuits of all kinds, although it does have some quirks. GANs are not particularly great at global structure. So this is uh, the fallout cow. Here, this cow has an extra body, just as you may have spent a night wandering around a house that is your house, but with many extra rooms. And these networks are also not particularly good at counting. So this monkey has eight eyes, because sometimes science goes too far. And so do something for me. Next time you think you're awake, which I think is now, um, count your fingers, just to be sure. Now, if you have more or fewer fingers than you expected, uh, try not to wake up just yet, because we're not quite done. Another interesting thing about the GAN training methodology is that the generator is being fed noise, this vector of noise, a random point in some high-dimensional space. And so it learns a mapping from that space onto its generation target, which in this case is faces. And if we take a point in that space and just kind of drag it around, we get this, which is also quite trippy, no? This resembles things that, I, that someone who isn't me has seen on acid. This resembles the sorts of things that you may have seen in Long Forgotten Dreams. I don't have a magic school bus voyage to take us on to understand why that is, but I do have a theory. When we see a face, a bunch of neurons in our brain light up and begin resonating a signal, which is the feeling of looking at that particular face. So taken together, all of the neurons in face detection produce a vector embedding, a mapping from faces to positions in some high-dimensional space, the vectors that are floating around our brain that underlie our cognitive processes. And so as we're dragging around the generator's vector here, we are also dragging around our own, which is a novel and unsettling sensation. So that's a bit of a wild theory but it's not without neurocognitive precedent. <clears throat> so here we have a rat in a cage. We've hooked up an electrode to a particular neuron in this rat's brain, and those pink dots are the locations where it's firing. If we speed it up, we're going to start to see a pattern emerge. This neuron is a grid cell, so named because the firing fields produce a triangular grid. There are a lot of grid cells in your brain, and each one of them aligns to a slightly different grid. They integrate data from your visual system, from head direction cells, which encode a quaternion for how your head is facing. And together, they construct an encoding of our position in 2D Euclidean space, which operates even in our sleep. If earlier you discover that you were dreaming and you want to see the end of this talk, but you're having trouble not waking up, Oneronauts recommends spinning around 
which detaches your perceived body, the one with 12 fingers and three extra bedrooms, from your physical body, which is lying in bed. This positioning system is something which, on some level, you always knew existed. After all, you, have a, you know where you are. You have a sense of space as you move through it. And it's likely, even necessary, if we believe that cognition is computation, that our qualitative sense of position has a neurocognitive precursor, some signal in the web that tells us where we're at, in many senses of the word. Part three, sticks and stones. <clears throat> so they say you can't tickle yourself because you know it's coming. Specifically, when your brain sends an action command to your muscles, that's called an efference. When an efference is sent, your brain makes a copy. Now, makes a copy sounds very planned and engineered. Your brain is this big, evolved signal processing mesh. So another way to think of efference copies is as reflections. We take the efference and we send it out to our peripheral nerves, where it will presumably make some muscles contract. Meanwhile, from the efference copy, we predict how our body's state will change, and we use that to update our brain's model of our body's state. If we didn't do that, then we would have to wait for sensory data to come back to tell us what happened. Where is my hand right now? And then we would face the same problem as trying to play a twitchy video game over a crap connection. Signals take about 10 milliseconds to go from our brain to our periphery, and another 10 milliseconds to come back. So our nervous system is not that low latency or high bandwidth. And so to enable smooth, coordinated movements, our brain has to make predictions. So life goes on. But in a moment, we're going to have a problem, because we will still receive sense data from our nerves. And if we updated our models again, then they would actually fall out of sync, the double apply problem. And so this signal we attenuate and keep our model in sync. This attenuation applies even to our sense of touch, when that touch is an expected consequence of our own movement. So this is obviously a pretty complex model, and aspects of it are likely distributed throughout our brain. But there is one place that's particularly important in maintaining it, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a pretty special place. It contains half of the neurons in our body. All action commands from the brain to the body route through it, and all sensations from the body to the brain as well. It's long been recognized as vitally important to our motor coordination, like this. So people with cerebellar damage have difficulty performing this action smoothly. With cerebellar damage, our movements become jerky and laggy. It's theorized that the cerebellum acts as a Smith predictor, our brain's controller for our latency-distant bodies, able to estimate the body's current pose, integrate sensory feedback to update the model, and decompose gross actions generated elsewhere in the brain into a fine-tuned, continuously varying control signal. And once you've got it, such a thing has many uses. There's a growing body of evidence implicating the cerebellum in language, which makes sense. Utterance is a kind of movement, and language, she said, sort of gesticulating wildly, is not limited to utterance. The work of moving words is not very different from the work of moving the body. They are both transformations, from the space of internal states, of efference and ideas, to the space of world coordinates and external sense impressions and other people. And so what happens when this predictor encounters a problem, when there is an irreconcilable disc discontinuity in the model? Nothing. Nothing happens.
these things are not so different. They're visceral, they're guttural, they shake our bones. And jokes, too, are shaped like trauma. They're both shatterings. They're the illuminations of discontinuities. They're paradoxes, the recognition of things which cannot be and yet somehow are, things which we must revisit again and again, churning water, smoothing the edges of cutting stone, the machinery of our brain trying to make sense of a world that resists it. When I was developing this talk, it was a pretty difficult time for me. I didn't think I could do it. The world seems to be falling apart, which has not changed. I got dumped, which definitely didn't help. And there were days when I would open my email, and every subject line seemed like a stone, and I wanted to put them all into my dress and walk out into the sea. But I didn't, because I remembered that I am a process of creation. I am a song singing myself. We are stories telling ourselves. We are the sea understanding itself, creating within us every moment, our churning waves creating every moment of exquisite joy and exquisite agony and everything else. It's you. It's all you. You are everything. Everything you have ever seen and every place you have ever been, every song you have ever sung, every god you have ever prayed to, every person you have ever loved, and the boundaries between you and them and the sea and the stars are all in your head. Thank you. Do you want to do some questions? We have time. Yeah? Yeah, go on yeah. then. Can we stick the Slido up, please? Go to slido.com, hashtag craft conference to get your question in. Uh, I'm going to read them. You're going to answer them. Okay. Okay? Uh, first, what are your thoughts on replacing the human visual system with an artificial one and learning? Um, for what use case? Okay. <laughs> Anonymous like, in my eyes, I think the... I think that interface is the hard problem. Is that clear? <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> next one. First up, wonderful presentation, video, and explanations. What software did you use for creating the presentation? With, uh, can we go to the next question? Whoever it's, that was, you can come ask Ashley and she'll answer. Or she'll say it quickly now while we're moving the next one on. Uh, I'll, I'll say it now. It's all, it's all um, HTML and CSS. There you go. Next. Will GANs find commercial purpose that is ethical as well? Um, so every, every one of those fake images is detectable as fake by the discriminator. So I think, especially as we go into this future where we just can't trust any image we see of anything, having ensemble models of, um, of recognizers that can say this was probably generated by a, by a neural network of this type will be pretty valuable, yeah. And then also there's just pumping out tons of, I mean, there's the other side of it, which is like generating, I don't know, Thor's hammer or like doing special effects or generating content, um, which seems really sort of baseline ethical. Cool, next question. Um, what is that trippy video used for? This talk. <laughs> Also, other talks, I'm sure. It's, I didn't make it. <laughs> Mikhail best, made it. Best answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, next question, uh, a light and very easy one. What is the answer to life, universe, and everything for you? Um, I just said it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Watch the talk again. They're all it's recorded. All next. Yeah. How does the hydrophobic binding affect H2... Or almost affect HT2A protein's crystal structure? Does it affect it or LSD acts as a competitive inhibitor? Um, I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> I know a bit about microbiology, but not, or about molecular biology, but not that deeply. 
It's cool though, I got to ask a question about LSD. Yeah. <laughs> Next one, where can we find the trippy video? Uh, it is, uh, so this whole talk is available online and there is a link to Mikkel's video on YouTube, which I should have had in the talk and will when you go to see it online. There you go. Uh, presumably that's the same answer for can we do download your presentation from somewhere, please? Yeah, I think the last slide, oh, it's this one. We if, can get this back up. Yeah, if we can put Watch this back incredible. up. See? That's the lfm.ashi.io. This talk is up there online. You can page right. through it. You can see the presenter notes. I'm gonna give everyone an opportunity to take photos of the screen. Go on. Yeah. Nice work, guys. Okay, we good? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 they're still doing. And right, that's enough. Questions back up, do we have any more? Um, do you think we will be able to record it or insert dreams ever? Yes. Good, do you know? <laughs> we, we, uh, we kind of can now, right? there's like rudimentary fMRI, you can get these like very hazy images and that's with extremely, extremely low resolution scanning of the brain. I think one of two things are going to happen in the future, either we will get very high resolution, we will develop progressively higher resolution brain scanning or human civilization will collapse and there will be only tardigrades and cockroaches, both seem I, that's, the second seems slightly less likely, but, you know, those are the branches we have for Best us. Best <laughs> intro to lunch ever. <laughs> Think is, about tardigrades as yeah, you're eating uh, your sausage. <laughs> is, there way, is there a way to identify, in, uh, I can't speak now, is there a way to identify a fake face? Yeah, so it turns out that it is, when you're training an adversarial network, it is better for the adversary to be stronger because the generator, because if it's not, the generator can lose its gradient and just stop being able to learn. And so generally, the adversarial component of these GANs will be able to detect most of the fake faces that the GANs can detect or can generate. So there's hope for us, but that hope in being able to like weed through the inevitable sea of fake imagery, but that hope means that we give up this epistemic sense that we can look at something and tell from the pixels that it's been shopped because that's gone. You have to, now you have to ask friend computer what's true and what's not. This, this is not on here, this is just me. Is, this, is there anyone who, is there is any like face that has existed as a fake face and then a real person came? And looked just like them? Yeah. I... No is your answer to your question, it's fine. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, it would be really interesting to find people who look like the fake faces because they must exist, right? They look like very plausible people. It looks plausible to me. Yeah. Um, okay, last one and then I'll stop wasting all of your time. Do you know a use case of one of those generative networks? I think it's mostly content generation. So like Adobe's content aware fill, I don't know if it uses that particularly, but. Anytime you're like, gosh, I just wish I could put a random person in this scene, or I wish I could create a character and have it look believable, that's, GANs are extreme, GANs and these kinds of um, generative neural networks are very good at producing content. Cool, um, mm -hmm. we're gonna finish it there. A big round of applause again for Ashi.